Welcome to the latest webinar with Laser and Skin Surgery Center of New York. You have tuned in for our webinar with Dr. Shim, and she is speaking on early skin cancer detection and the latest in non-invasive imaging techniques. I'm really excited for you guys to see the presentation she has in store for you. But first, let me just quickly introduce Dr. Shim for those of you that do not know her. She's an incredible board certified dermatologist. And not only is she a board certified dermatologist, but she actually has three board certifications in anatomic uh, pathology, derma, dermatopathology, and dermatology. A lot of ologies. <laughs> so um, the way that she looks at skin because of her almost two decades practicing pathology is really quite different than so many other dermatologists. She always says she looks kind of from the skin, from the up, from the bottom up instead of from the top down. So she does have a unique approach. Um, her, her favorite quote is to tell patients, I know you on a microscopic level. And I think that really helps kind of just share who she is. But mostly her practice is really focused around what, what she's speaking on today, which is skin cancer prevention and treatment. She also was the head of um, inpatient consultation services at Mount Sinai for many, many years. So she really likes complex dermatology. And most of the patients that she sees and that are referred to her are very complex cases. So what she's gonna go over today is very unique from a general skin cancer exam that many dermatologists do. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Shim. Thanks, Riza. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me tonight. So I'll be speaking to you, everyone, about skin cancer, a little background of skin cancer, some statistics, as well as uh, some non-invasive techniques that I use in the office and that are available in general. So skin cancer is the most common cancer currently in the US and worldwide. Um, it's quite frequent. You can see one in five Americans will develop skin cancer by the age of 70. And every day, uh, approximately 9,500 people are diagnosed with skin cancer. And it is actually the uh, most common cancer um, and, and more than any other cancers combined. So when we talk about skin cancer, we're really talking about the top three types of cancer here, the basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. Um, there are other less um, common ones, such as Merkel cell carcinoma, microcystic adnexal carcinoma, but these are the top three that we see quite often. And um, I'll speak about each of them, and I'm just showing you, as Riza said, you know, I'm a pathologist by background, where these cancer cells originate. And it actually talks a lot about how they behave as well. So um, I'm gonna start speaking to you uh, from basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma is a very common skin cancer. It occurs from the basal layer, which is the bottom layer of the epidermis, which is the top part of your skin. And the cells down here at the base start growing abnormally. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common form of skin cancer. It's quite prevalent. 3.6 million cases are diagnosed each year. Um, very common on sun exposed areas like the face, the nose, and the cheeks. Uh, pretty universal is a history of excessive sun exposure. Um, and key here is actually indoor tanning. In fact, it can happen in very young patients, uh, like in their 20s. I've had a young lady who had a basal cell carcinoma on her upper lip. She was 22 years old. And I also had um, a you know, young guy who was about 30 and he was a landscaper. He also had a basal cell. So it's not that skin cancers only happen in much older patients. You can actually have them quite young, just depending on your risk factor. So here, as you can see, the indoor tanning is significant. Um, and I'm glad that there are now regulations against indoor tanning um, for patients under age 18 or people under 18, because you can actually increase your risk of developing basal cell cancer by 69% by the age of 40. 
So these are what uh, basal cells can look like. Uh, they're typically like a tan or pearly papule. So this is pearly, you can see they're sort of translucent here. Um, as they develop, they will then develop sometimes an ulcer or erosion in the center, like here and here. And so some of the older textbooks will call it like a rodent ulcer, it looked like actually a rodent has been eating through the skin. It's very slow growing. It, it has been reported to metastasize or spread beyond the local area, but that's very, very uncommon. Um, and just you know, for fun, the pathology is the basal cells here are growing, invading the deeper part of the skin called the dermis, and they're forming these tumor nodules. So treatment for basal cells can be very uh, simple. Sometimes we'll treat them with creams. There's one of them called a Miquelon that you apply at home, very simple. Occasionally we will do some uh, liquid nitrogen treatment, cryotherapy. Rarely we can also do electrodesiccation. That's when we electrodesiccate and, and then we scrape. Surgical excision is pretty common, especially off the face. Um, but if it's on the face, most micrographic surgery is also used. So the next um, most common skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, back to the uh, histology of the skin, the cells in this area, so if this is the basal, this is, this, this is actually called the squamous layer. And the cells in this layer called keratinocytes are the ones growing atypically and you can see this growth here. So it can actually go up and form this ulcer and it can also go down and start invading. So squamous cell carcinoma is a slightly older age group than basal cells. Um, they commonly have a long history of UV exposure. So for instance, the, uh, the farmer who's been farming for many years, uh, it's actually pretty common and people have a boat and they sail for many years. Um, some of them can have a precancerous stage called an actinic or solar keratosis. Um, this is a good uh, point to treat because 10% of these actinic keratosis can go on to true squamous cells in a matter of 10 years. So when we see the actinic keratosis, it's good to treat it at that point because that's, um, that's really preventative. Sometimes you can have like a sudden onset, what we call keratoacanthoma. It's a type of squamous cell that the patients will come and say, this spot occurred in a matter of a few days or a few weeks, and I don't even know where it came from. Um, that is a low grade uh, squamous cell carcinoma called the keratoacanthoma. It can also occur in places unusual uh, and, and really don't have UV exposure, such as fingers and toes, and many of them are related to a viral infection by human papillomavirus. So there, you know, a good number of uh, patients have squamous cells each year, 1.8 million cases, um, especially patients who are immunosuppressed, like organ transplant patients are very susceptible. They're actually 100 times more likely to develop squamous cell carcinoma. So these patients do have to be screened often and early lesions treated. Um, as mentioned, the precancer stage called actinic keratosis can actually be present for many, many years. And um, different from basal cell, the squamous cells can actually spread. They can metastasize. Not common, but can happen in long-standing large lesions that are invasive. And very commonly, actually, when you when this happens, the origin of this cancer is from the head and neck area. So clinically, they can look like many things. Here, you can just see a little bit of um, red scaly patch. Some people may mistake this for lesion of eczema. Um, it can even look a little more pearly, like a basal cell. It can look like a non-healing ulcer like here, or as I mentioned, that keratoacanthoma, they typically, this is one of the features of keratoacanthoma, they look like a nodule or a bump on the skin. And under the microscope, the cells who originated up here are coming down, 
and forming these lo large lobule invasive tumor nests. Treatments for squamous cells. When you were at the actinic keratosis stage, which is pre-cancer, there are many options, creams, freezing, curetting, and something called photodynamic therapy, which is a treatment where a chemical is applied and then a light source is applied on top of it. It's a, it's a nice treatment where you treat the whole area rather than a single lesion. Uh, it's not indicated for anything beyond actinic keratosis in this country, but in Europe, it has been used successfully for squamous cells and basal cells. When we have squamous cells of the face, fingers, toes, like very uh, difficult sites, usually they go for most uh, surgery. Other sites typically get surgery, uh, just a general excision. And then in certain cases uh, where patients are just not well, they really can't go through surgery or the lesion is too big, they can be treated by radiation. And as I said, different from basal cell, we can have lymph node spread. And when that happens, sometimes they need immunotherapy or systemic chemotherapy. So this is, when we talk about skin cancer, I think a lot of patients really talk about this which is malignant melanoma. And unlike basal cells and squamous cells, which really seem to be, have you know, an early lesion and then slowly progress, melan um, melanomas are sometimes unpredictable. So they occur from these cells here. You can see they look like they're putting out these little um, hair-like processes. These, this is the melanocyte. So that's the cell that is normally actually in the basal layer um, next to the basal cells. And you can see one for every eight to 10 or 13 um, basal cells. You can see a single melanocyte. And the melanocytes are uh, actually responsible for giving you a tan color. They'll actually spread out these processes and melanin, the pigment spreads upward to give you, pig, you know, a tan. So when we have these atypical melanocytes here, they're growing and they, you can see the color usually from the surface and they also start to grow down. So um, the statistics for malignant melanoma are, are you know, a little bit scary. They, um, although the number of new cases are not as many as, as basals and squamous, squamous cells, the number of patients who die from melanoma is a lot higher than you would expect from just a regular skin cancer. Um, they are diagnosed you know, later in life, 65, but unfortunately you can actually see patients who are in their 30s and even 20s and even in their teens with melanoma. Mm -hmm. And it is considered one of the most common cancers in young adults, especially in young women. So um, they can occur slightly uh, differently for men and women. So um, for men, especially scalp, head, where they're losing hair, they can't really see back there is common. The back of the neck, people don't wear collared shirts much anymore. The back itself, you know, you see people running outside without shirts or go to a baseball game and take their shirt off. And in the trunk, same thing, they might take off their shirt. For women, um, it could be also from the short sleeve fashion that we're wearing and as well as on their legs, so shorts and skirts. Um, you know, the, the survival rate for melanoma is really what makes these tumors very scary. When we're localized, we have a 99% survival rate, which is excellent. But when they're distant metastases, it's a very, very poor prognosis. So although overall it's a good number in terms of survival, we really want to be up here uh, when we find it. So the risk factors for melanoma, definitely UV exposure. It's, it's the most um, common risk factor or the one that you know, is, is really the problem. And having five or more sunburn um, in your life doubles your risk. Weakened immune system, uh, patients who've had uh, any kind of uh, transplant or leukemia, any kind of cancer, they definitely are more uh, susceptible. 
sometimes people have a lot of moles. Um, you could have some patients who average patient will probably have a dozen moles, but I've seen patients who basically have 500 moles. And the more number of moles you have, the more likelihood that um, some of these moles may actually be atypical. And if you have atypical moles, more, more likelihood you will actually may have a de develop a melanoma. Another risk factor is fair skin, eyes, um, and then also hair, especially red hair is very susceptible. And a, a history, either um, a personal history or family history, especially of melanoma. And as I said, melanoma can actually run in families, especially if you have like first degree relatives, you know, brother, sister, mother, uncle. I mean, there are families where it just keeps going, grandmother. Um, those, those patients really need to be screened often. So melanoma, is, as we know now, it's a very serious form of skin cancer. As I mentioned, these are these melanocytes. They are definitely less common, but because of the ability to do this, which is form invasion, and you can see it's going down into the blood vessels. Um, and this can actually happen fairly quickly. It can take many years, but it can also take a matter of weeks to months. So we can never predict melanoma behavior and thus when you find them, you know, we act very quickly. So why is UV so important in melanoma? Well, when we have our uh, DNA, these are called thymidines. So these are bases of thymidines is your regular DNA. When we have light UV light, it actually causes these dimers where they bond. And then this bonding causes this kink in the DNA. And now you're gonna be replicating mutated DNA. So um, this is just a normal skin with these melanocytes. We're just showing this um, pathology here. These cells start to grow sideways called a uh, horizontal growth phase and they start spreading up. But then once they're done up, they then go down and that's the gro uh, vertical growth phase. Types of melanomas, the most common is called the superficial spreading melanoma. They're more flat. They tend to show uh, some variation of color and shape. Um, you can see black and brown, but you can also see strange colors like gray, blue, pink, uh, even white. Less common is something called nodular melanoma. It actually can be mistaken for just a benign mole because you can see it looks fairly innocent here. Another type is called lenticle, uh, uh, lenticle malignant melanoma. It happens in sun exposed areas, especially on the face. It can happen like on the arms or chest. They're usually older patients because the background is chronic sun damage. Um, they are hard to recognize because they don't tend to raise up. And sometimes they actually look a lot like the background um, freckle changes. Not very common is the aqualentiginous melanoma. These are the ones found in palms and soles and fingernails. But the people who are susceptible to this are usually patients who are African-American or Latino background and Asian as well. So management, treatment and management, um, as, I, as we spoke a little bit about, Tumor thickness is actually very, very important because it's associated with prognosis. So, you know, we're talking about surgical excision and these are this is the surgical margin. And as you can see, if we find them when they're confined to the skin called in situ, the margin is very narrow. But as the lesion gets thicker and thicker, your margin gets wider and wider. Um, beyond two centimeters, they didn't find any benefit. So we stay at two centimeter margin uh, for these lesions that are deep. And um, be, besides surgical excision, uh, we also have lymph node dissection. And then we, you know, when, once they start to spread to lymph node and beyond, you know, they will do chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy. And the prognostic variable, this is the most important prognostic variable is actually the depth of the tumor. So in situ, which is confined to the surface, so up here, um, is considered 
95 to 100 percent. It's excellent. But once we have um, depth into the dermis, we start to go down in terms of um, prognosis. So after all that bad news, I think we, would, we should shift gears and talk about what can we do to try to prevent these skin cancers because prevention is the key to this. Um, number one is actually limit UV exposure. Um, kids under 18, kids who go to camp, who, who spend their summers at the beach, very, very important. Um, I, I think that some camps don't emphasize enough the need to protect their campers because before age 18, they're very susceptible. Sun protection. Uh, there's a lot out there now to protect your skin. You know, sunscreen, sun protective clothing. Of course, you can always seek shade. And then there are things that you can do at home, self, a skin self-exam, and of course, by a full skin exam by a dermatologist. So this is a saying, very easy to remember, is slip, slop, slap, and wrap. This is a way to try to protect yourself from UV exposure. You're gonna put on a shirt, you know, put on a hat, sun, uh, sunglasses, sunscreen. So I was talking quite a bit about ultraviolet rays. You know, what is it? So in sunlight, we actually have UVA, UVB, and UVC radiation. Um, UVA and B come down and can be affecting our skin. So B stays up at the top of your skin. Sorry, I think this thing's flipped a little bit, but anyway, UVA goes a little deeper this label is wrong, it should be dermis. And UVB stays at the top and UVC does not actually reach the sur uh, surface of the earth. So it'd be more an artificial source. Um, UV rays are very strong when it's between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So that's when people should try to avoid going out directly into the sun if possible. It does reflect actually off of sand and water, cement and snow. So when people go skiing, they really have to wear sunscreen. Um, high altitude, so you're closer to the sun, closer to the equator, summer months, these are when the rays are stronger. And this is something that patients ask me quite often. What happens on a cloudy day? Well, you know, you could have a little bit of reduction in the UV rays, but not much. And it's certainly not enough to prevent you from getting a burn. So as I mentioned before, children and UV exposure, it's very important when we're talking about prevention. They have different type of skin, it's thinner. Children also are spend quite a bit of time outdoors. Um, they like playing outside and they're really not aware. They're not, they don't even really register if they're really getting you know, a little bit of a sunburn. They are growing fast. So they're in a dynamic state, which means that if there are any DNA changes, it replicates fast with them. It can also, they have a long time to develop these diseases, um, sim similar to this idea. And this is very important. Up to 80% of a person's lifetime exposure to UV is received before the age of 18. So very, very important to protect your kids and because you really wanna to try to prevent melanoma later in life. When we talk about sun protection, you will see labels on sunscreen. Some of them will say, you will see sunscreen bottles will say SPF. And then you'll see clothing that has UPF. So SPF is sun protection factor. So it's really just um, a multiplier of how long you can stay in the sun without getting a burn. So if you put no sunscreen, you'll burn in about 10 minutes. But if you put on an SPF of 50, which gives you 50 times um, the protection of no sunscreen, you should be able to spend 500 minutes before you get a sunburn. For UPF, it's really the ability of the clothing to protect you from UV rays. So an UPF of 50 will block 49 out of 50 of the UV rays. Some protective clothing is one of my favorite things because it's so easy to just put on and take off. Um, 
you not you don't have to deal with messy creams or missing a spot. And I I wear them and I really like them. And I actually I think it keeps me cool. Um, it doesn't wash out through washes, and you know can reach parts that are very hard to reach on yourself and your children. And when kids are wiggling around and they don't want you to put sunscreen on, they usually don't like that feeling. You know, if you can put a shirt on and get them used to putting a shirt and shirt on at the beach, it's they will they won't mind as they get older. My son is 21 years old and he still wears his sunscreen shirts when he goes out, you know, at the beach. So speaking of sunscreens, um, daily use of sunscreens will definitely reduce your risk of developing you know, skin cancers, all of them, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. There are uh, several types of sunscreens. So there's a type called physical or mineral sunscreen, and they contain basically particles that are not absorbed, so titanium or zinc, and they work by scattering the rays. So they deflect the, the rays before they even get to your skin. The chemical sunscreens um, that have other ingredients like avobenzone, they don't scatter, they actually absorb um, into the sunscreen at the top layers of the skin. There are some that are combination because you can actually, both of these working together is quite, quite good, it works well. But whatever sunscreen you use, most importantly, you have to apply enough. So enough is really one ounce for the body and you must reapply every two hours if you're not wet or whenever your skin gets wet, you need to reapply. Um, people commonly forget places like lips, ears, you know, back of neck, upper chest. And I do see this quite often, actually the top of the feet because you put on everywhere else, but the feet, well, the feet will burn. So this just tells you that um, how much, this is let's say one ounce and how much you should put in for each part of your body. And then this just shows you how much is half a teaspoon and so on. So this is what one ounce looks like. So um, this year, especially, there's a lot of talk about benzene being found in sunscreen. And uh, a group called Valashore had petitioned to the FDA that there were a lot of products on the market which have benzene, which is a carcinogen. And when they started looking into it, uh, it was not very easy to understand because there were many, many sunscreens involved in this, not just one or two brands. But if you're interested, look this up and you can actually find these tables and, and um, the actual sunscreens and how much benzene they contain. So you could just see, you know, I just took a quick shot, but it's not just Neutrogena or Vino, it's many, many brands as, as I mentioned here. So it's hard to say I, I'm not gonna use any Neutrogena or whatever, but if you notice one thing, many of them are the sprays. So these are spray, 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 spray. So if you try to stick with the lotion or even a stick, uh, they do have sticks, I think that you're doing, um, you're somewhat safe, but to be honest, some of these they say are contaminants and they're not even inherent to the product. So it's a little difficult right now. Um, I guess one way to avoid it is just maybe stick to the mineral sunscreens. They are just pure, I call it almost like brown sand. You just put it on and just physically blocks everything. So um, how do you do a skin self exam? Well, first of all, you should try to do it once a month. And um, because, you know, you will find stuff more often than the dermatologist. You will see a dermatologist maybe once a year, or if you are higher risk, you might see them every three to six months. But things can grow in that time. And if you're familiar with your skin, uh, you will get to know what is normal and what is not. So. Supplies that I would recommend, um, you get a full length and a hand mirror, a comb, and even a camera to take pictures of some of the spots. So whether you're at risk or not, knowing your skin, knowing where your moles are, or knowing what you have on your skin is very important because 
I can't tell you how many times a patient came to me and said, and pointed, you know, just point to a spot and say, this is not my skin. This is very unusual for me. And sometimes I would look at it. I'm not really sure. It doesn't have, let's say, the classic changes I look for. But I, you know, nine out of 10 times the patient was correct. There was some reason to take that off. So knowing your own skin is important. Um, when we spoke about, you should try to note how many, when, where your freckles are, so you get to know what's normal and what's not normal. And take your photos. They're very important. Photos are very helpful, even to the dermatologist when you bring them. So here, you know, you have your full length mirror. You can see at least the backs of your legs. Some of you, sometimes you can see a little bit of your back itself and um, bend your elbow, look under your arms, look at the bottom of the feet between toes, very important. And you can use, let's say a, a second mirror and you can get a good view of the back and, and your neck. Um, you know, th this might be a little tough, but you try anyway. It's a lot better than not doing it at all. So what, what you should be looking for are actually some of the things I look for. One of the things is called the ugly duckling sign. Well, many of your moles are beautiful swans, but here is the ugly duckling. It's, it's kind of moving in the right, the wrong direction. That's one. Anything that you notice that changes, it itches or bleeds. And then um, you may have heard this before, the ABCDEs. I look for this as well, but we look at some spot and you look for asymmetry. So let's say you cut this in half, this part and this part do not resemble each other. So that's asymmetry. Order is when the edge is not nice and smooth, except in, in fact, it's a little notched and um, irregular. Color is actually having multiple colors or unusual colors. As I mentioned, you can have strange colors. You can have red and, and blue and gray and white. Those are not normal colors for a, a regular mole that's benign. Diameter um, is, they say, greater than five millimeters. I find diameter to me is not as helpful because I've found very small lesions that are atypical and very large lesions that really aren't doing anything, but it's good to pay attention to the larger lesions for sure. And for me, the most important is E, evolving. Has it changed? So when you have a small mole that was one millimeter and went to two millimeter, still small, but that actually doubled in size. So these are very important things to watch out for, um, for yourself as, as dermatologists do that as well. Um, and then we talked about chronicity. Something just doesn't go away. It's important. Uh, it might be a skin cancer. So who should get screened? This is a very important question. And unfortunately, there is no guideline. So no one came out and said, well, patients should get a screen every year, every two years. There just is no guideline, unfortunately, but some groups have come up with some recommendations. So the Skin Cancer Foundation is recommending that a patient get a professional skin exam once a year. So you, know, you go to your internist once a year, you get your blood done once a year, go to get your skin checked once a year. At Memorial Sloan Kettering, of course, they do see much more uh, patients with risk, but they say, especially if, if you've had a melanoma or you have blood relatives with a melanoma, you have um, one, one or more atypical moles that you know were biopsied and called dysplastic, or you have lesions like actinic keratosis, which could cause a squamous cell down the line. Um, so Riza asked me to talk about this. So I think it's actually a very good point. There are different types of skin exams. Um, this is what I call the standard skin exam. And this is what dermatologists do. They will spend, you know, it can be five, 10, 15 minutes with a patient, depending on um, complexity. And your average patient really doesn't have much. So they don't have a significant personal or family history, may have a couple of moles. 
Um, in this kind of patient, the dermatologist will observe and measure and maybe biopsy a lesion or two, and then follow them yearly. This is a um, very still very comprehensive. It's a short exam, but it's comprehensive and fine for patients who really don't have much going on. Then there is more of the extensive skin exam uh, where patients are seen and really examined very, very closely because they have a lot of risk factors. They have a lot of moles. They have a lot of this plastic nevus. It's in their family, it's in them. They may have family history or a personal history of melanoma. In this case, um, looking at a patient just within um, five to 15 minutes, it's actually not enough to get a good understanding of what's going on because many of these moles need to be measured and charted and followed. We talked about E, A, B, C, D, E. E is extremely important. And when we have lesions that need to be followed over time, we're looking for E, ev um, evolving or evolution. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of this in slides coming up, but Part of the um, exam is sometimes people use sequential photography of single lesions, total body photography, and these patients get usually followed up much more closely. So when you go to the doctor to get a skin exam, there are a few things you can do. Uh, number one, try not to wear makeup because it actually will hide stuff under the uh, makeup and it's, it's you can't see and, and you can't tell what it is. So I will remove the makeup, but it's better if you don't wear it and then you can put it on after. Remove nail polish. Uh, fingers and toes, because you can actually have changes in the beds and the cuticles. Um, and when you have uh, nail polish, it can actually uh, camouflage that and you can't tell what's going on underneath. Keep your hair loose. So for women, you know, it's great if they can just let them leave their hair out. So can, I actually have, um, you know, cotton tip applicator and I'll just make a part and look. Just makes it much easier to check the scalp. Guys who have very short haircut though, that's very easy to do, but yeah, keep it loose. And then anything that you've noticed, um, you know, write them down, you know, the list of things that you wanna go over with your doctor because those are important and you may forget during your exam. So during the skin exam, you know, you're brought into the room, you do take all your clothes off, you put on a gown, uh, depending on, you know, the medical history risk factor, sometimes patients uh, will keep their underwear on or take it off. It's a head to toe exam. As I said, it starts with your scalp, goes down to your ears and you know, all the way down. Um, and all the way down to your genitals and buttocks and even between the toes. And if anything is atypical or suspicious, you may get a biopsy and it will be removed. And then the lab, you know, you get your biopsy and you get your results in about one to two weeks. So what do I do in my practice? Very similar to that extensive exam. Um, first of all, I see a lot of patients um, more often. So, I would say six months is my average, but I definitely see patients every three and, and sometimes once a year if things are quiet. I also look you know, between the toes and all of that. This is a little bit unique to me, body mapping. I'm actually mapping the moles onto a, um, little images of the body. I also make charts of lesions. So they actually get an individual number um, when I first notice, and then that number stays unique to that spot. So it could be the right upper arm, five inches below top shoulder, and number one. And that will stay number one as I follow photography, biopsy, surgery, or a recurrence. Um, so it just makes it easier for me because I do see patients with 500 moles. Um, dermoscopic, it, this dermoscopy, and I'll go over this later, is basically a very detailed magnification of the skin spot uh, with polarized light. So we can actually get a very nice detail of that spot. Uh, there might be photography with sequential photos, also total body photography. And my aim, as you can see from all this, honestly, it's really to try to figure out what is your normal, what is your um, 
what is abnormal. And then there's some that are slightly different appearing, which I call signature spots or signature moles, which are unique to you. Um, and that group I see repeating throughout the body. And I, I learned what those are and they are not on my radar, of course, because those are your, those are unique to you, like uh, your fingerprint. And doing all that really takes a lot of time and it takes many visits, but um, you know, some of my patients I've had for 15 plus years and I've known them so well that there are times when I'll say, you know, this spot, you don't make this, this is not you. You know, I, I know your moles. I've seen your moles how many times? It's actually like in my head too. I know your moles. And sometimes I actually know my patients by their moles, which is a little odd. And I'll actually remember their moles. So it's good to know them. And doing all this, I get to learn what they are because my aim is to detect it very early. When I showed the numbers of the um, prognosis and you know the depth of the lesion and survival rate, that's all very scary. But if I get it at a much lower grade, then it's, it's done, it's, it's a quick size and, and you go on with your life. So as I said, they, the lesions may be um, photographed, followed, some of them will have biopsies, but some of them also don't need to be biopsied. I might um, look at them with a special kind of imaging or a tape stripping test. So overall, my goal is do not, you know, do many biopsies if possible. I don't want to, but do them when I have to. So my biopsies tend to be very focused. And when I do them, I tend to have uh, more of a positive rate because they are already vetted and are most likely pretty, they're most likely um, malignant or atypical or just need to come off. So I mentioned dermoscopy and it's, this is a dermatoscope. It's, a, it's really like a magnifier that gets a good detail of spots on the skin. And when we do dermoscopy, here's the spot. You can see what it was doing before and on follow-up, you know, it's actually changed. You can see this part's changed here. It got lighter, but bigger. You can see this pigment streak. Again, here, from one visit to the next. These are spots that are very hard to see with a naked eye in terms of changes. Even when we measure, sometimes this measurement is only a slightly larger. And, but with this demoscopy, you could really see the changes very well. Here again, you can see the change. So when we see changes like this, um, we can make the decision to remove. But there are sometimes lesions that look like this that don't change from visit to visit. And yes, they may have slight of some of the features of the ABCDs, but if they don't change, most likely they're not gonna do anything. Total body photography is another thing that I use. And you know, as you can see here, uh, we're doing photograph in really the front, the side, so on. And then there are other photos I, I use here of oblique sections, the sides. I have people do poses and so on, inner legs. But what is that all about? Well, we're looking for um, changes on the skin. So when we do comparison of photos, one visit to the next, here you can actually see this grouping. And then this is brand new. Without total body photography, yes, I try to keep my mind um, always thinking about these moles, but this is a lot of moles. So in the sea of moles, it's hard to detect that one new one. And sometimes these lesions, as I said, don't have much features when we look up close with a dermatoscope. But knowing that this is a new lesion, especially in adults or older patients, that's a red flag. That is a spot that most likely needs to come off. Um, another thing that I use in my office is called the reflective confocal microscopy. And it's a special, um, I call it a virtual biopsy. So it's almost like doing a biopsy, but without the pain, it's non-invasive. And this, it, this is basically a very large head where the bottom of it is basically the microscope lens and you put it right on the skin. And 
this is RCM, reflective confocal microscopy, it's, it's very similar to almost getting a biopsy. So you saw the many layers of the skin on the schematics below before, and you can see that we can get these images that really look like we're actually looking at parts of the skin here. What is it good for? Well, for instance, this spot on somebody, I think this is on the neck, um, person's had other stuff removed. And when we're doing the imaging here, um, well, first of all, when we get the dermoscopy image, this is the dermoscopy image. You know, it's, it's not always easy to recognize some of these tumors because yes, we look for extra blood vessels and maybe we look for something that's a bump, but it's not always so easy. It's not, it doesn't have that many features. It has a little bit of pigment instead of could it be a melanoma? Could it be a squamous cell? Could it be a basal cell? It could be many things. But with the RCM, we're getting images that look like this. These are tumor nodules, tumor nodules. And when these were biopsied, sure enough, these are the tumor nodules. And this is without an actual biopsy. So there are some patients that I find this and I will actually send them straight to surgery or most because we know how deep they go, how wide they go, and then we know what kind of margins we need. So we can skip a biopsy in this kind of uh, case. It could also be used in, in um, unusual places. This is actually on the lip. And um, you can see these cells here. They're very bright, large cells that, that go around near these follicles or follicular openings. These are actually melanoma cells. And when on the biopsy, you can see this proliferation of melanoma cells, and then these are uh, staining red. But we can see melanoma on something with the RCM. So again, uh, if we can do things without being invasive, it's very helpful. It's also helpful because the RCM can do a window that's eight millimeters. So we can see an area that's eight millimeters. You don't wanna get a biopsy that's eight millimeters if you can help it, but we can certainly look at it with an RCM. And again, one more case, this is um, again, you know, we know something's going on, but what is it? It's a fairly large lesion as well. Well, on the imaging, again, you can see these tumor nodules and you can confirm that with the pathology. And what I like about this reflective confocal is that there, we might be, as I said, able to get the whole image and, or we can break it up into several image, um, several images and we can figure out what this is. We don't have to just take one little biopsy. We can actually figure out what this whole lesion is. So another thing that I use in my office, which is a little more recent is, um, a tape stripping. And what this is, is basically a piece of tape, like scotch tape that is put on top of the skin and, and stuck on the skin. And this is a little circle I make at the top as to where, where the spot actually is. And then it just gets pulled off. It's painless. And, um, but it gives you a good, good amount of information because cells actually are at the surface of the skin do have some of the mutations below it. So the idea is that uh, at the top of the skin here, we see changes from down here, it's reflected. And it actually can help you sample 100% of the surface, whereas a biopsy, we may not be able to do so. Um, it looks for certain things. It looks for RNA, and it can also look for DNA changes. And these are different changes that they will show us on the report. If there's just one change, it's suspicious. Um, I will photograph, I will look, I will follow them closely. If I see two changes, it's very suspicious. And those usually get a biopsy. And of course, if it has all three, that is gonna probably need an excision right away. Um, there are other non-invasive devices uh, that are not in my office, but they are offered. And I'm gonna be speaking about these top three. The first one is uh, the optical coherence tomography or OCT. 
And OCT is, um, again, another non-invasive technique, but what it does, it actually provides the depth. So you measure the tumor. So it does more of the architecture. It doesn't tell us what the actual cell looks like. And what I showed you earlier, which is the RCM, is great at cell resolution, but it's not as good with thickness because it's much better at the upper part of the skin. So the OCT here, you can see this image. Down here, you can see this bulky tumor goes quite deep. And when you do the biopsy, again, it confirms it's a deep bulky tumor. And sorry, one more. It's very good for certain things that are not melanoma. For instance, tinnitus keratosis, squamous cells that are not invaded and basal cells, because these are all very much located in the dermal area. And that's what this machine is very good for down in here. It doesn't give much detail up here. As you can see, this just looks very cloudy. Um, and that certainly cannot be used for something like a melanoma, which is really all up here. Another device uses something called impedance. And impedance is basically just an electrical resistance. And different tissues and different tumors have different resistance properties. And that's what it uses to try to detect malignancy. Specifically, this is FDA approved, it's called NeviSense. And um, it uses that technique where this device is applied to the skin, they have these resistance measured back and forth. And these tumor cells will give you a different reading than non-tumor cells. It does help um, improve the detection of malignant melanoma. It's not widely used. Um, it's a little tricky to learn, but I do have a friend who really likes to use that. And lastly, I'm going to be speaking to you about temperature. This is on the horizon. There are actually many companies, many institutions trying to uh, get more devices that are non-invasive. Um, and one idea is temperature. So the idea is that tumors have different temperature than the surrounding skin. Tumors have typically more of blood vessel supply, so they will show a different heat signature. Uh, it can be used to detect basal cells and melanoma. And it's definitely evolving because um, the original uh, prototypes involved all these machineries, and now they're trying to come up with this. And so there's a lot of work to be done, but because there is so much interest in trying to get away from the traditional biopsies um, and trying to really pinpoint what's happening and become very specific and focused. Non-invasive um, imaging and detection is actually definitely on the horizon. So in summary, um, skin cancers are mostly preventable. And I really like to say, I love being in dermatology because I could see it. Thank God I'm not doing a liver biopsy or kidney biopsy. I could actually see what I'm looking, you know, what I'm targeting. So if it's, if it's something you can see and something you can remove, for sure it's preventable. Skin cancer is also very treatable. Um, you know, the margins that we use are not very wide margins. They might be two millimeters and on. Yes, you do end up with a scar, but then they're done. Early detection, especially for melanoma, is very, very important. Because as you know, as you saw, the survival rate could go as high as 100% or very, very low. And it really depends on when the lesion is found. And I do want to emphasize the early detection. I don't aim to find a spot that someone could say, you know, open a door and say, ah, that's, a, that's definitely a melanoma. By then, unfortunately, it's probably too late. So you want to get it when there's, you know, it, it's just beginning to change because that's when you get the best survival. And uh, at the end, I was talking about non-invasive techniques. It's really to be more sensitive and specific. Of course, we want to be able to find stuff early. And many of these devices are very close to skin biopsy results, but without the pain and um, the scarring. 
So thank you very much. I know it was a long talk. I hope it wasn't too dry. I, this is something I love. It's my passion. And this is my contact number. Thank you so much, Dr. Shim. I know everyone is clapping right now, even though we can't hear you. Um, that, that was a lot of good information. I want to remind everyone that this is recorded if you need to go back and watch it. Um, but even though it was a lot of really good information and so many helpful tips about even ways that we can do a better job with our self skin checks at home mm -hmm. that I even learned new today. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we just have a couple questions to get to. I know we're coming up on the hour, but I want to try and get to a couple. Sure. So um, let's see. Can you um, speak a little bit about it, about skin cancer and the scalp? Yep, that's a good question. Um, skin cancer in the scalp, just purely from the fact that women have more hair than men, so it will occur more commonly in men, especially as you're losing hair. And unfortunately, it can happen in women. So as we get older and our part gets wider, it can happen here as well. Um, it's hard to detect. People don't, you can't really see up there. So uh, unless you have a partner who notices something, and Quite often patients will say, you know, my wife, my husband can't stand looking at this thing. What is it? Well, that's good. You want your partner to say that because that's when we can tell. So skin cancers on the scalp are tricky though because um, they tend to get a little wide. It can get a little deep. And when you have surgery on your scalp, if you have hair, thank goodness you can cover. But when guys don't, you get an indent. So you know, we need to be much more aggressive about it. The creams we use tend to be stronger. And many of the patients do end up getting biopsies and moles, but it's very important because as we spoke about things that can spread, actually scalp is one of them. It can definitely spread if it's left there too long. Got it, okay, great. So let's see, someone else, um is asking if there was a link for that benzene sunscreen. That yeah, I so that was actually the link. Um, I'm just thinking, like, go back. If you look up Valishore and sunscreen and benzene online, it comes up right away. It's, uh, it's a link you can find. And they go right and they show you all the um, proposal and the the problems and all the sunscreen. So it's actually a very good list. Okay, it's a, the blog on Valishore's website? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great, I found it. I will, I will. Um, um, I was thinking of turning some of the lights on. I'm realizing, oh, <laughs> look like I'm in the dark. dark. Give it me one second. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for you and I'm gonna remove her chance. That's better, you can see me now. <laughs> okay, now you're a little larger. Okay, so, so a couple more questions. Uh, one, are you taking new patients right now? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I am having Mo's surgery on Wednesday, but after that, I'm seeking a new doctor. Um, <laughs> so great. Well, we would love love to see you. Um, then they ask, you know, do you take Aetna PPO? Yeah. So um, unfortunately, I don't participate directly with commercial insurance simply from the fact that I do spend so much time with the patients. But my patients who see me um, do get out of network benefits. And so they do get a reimbursement after seeing me. Um, you know, what I'm doing is not cosmetic, so they do get reimbursed, but it really depends on um, the deductible that they have to meet. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanna remind everyone that we have I think 15 board certified dermatologists at LSSC and many of them are in network and do accept Aetna PPO for a skin check, but the type of skin checks that Dr. Shim provides are really quite unique and they're really for a very unique subset of patients that maybe have a lot of moles or have a really aggressive um, history of skin cancer from themselves or their family. Um, but she could definitely do a consultation and help advise you and, and guide you. Um, and we'd be happy to, you know, help schedule you with her or someone else. So either way you can call us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I usually offer a 30 minute consultation visit and, you know, I would go over your uh, history. We would go over any of the things that we talked about in terms of skin cancer. I do a brief exam for me, a 10 minute exam, 10 to 15 is a very, very brief exam. 
And then at the end, um, we have a summary of what I found and what I think you may need. And some patients don't need much, just a couple of photos, and I might even say see you in a year. Um, but more often than not, just simply because patients end up having to, you know, so much being done or the dermatologist, say, I, you have too much, we can't cover it, then they send them to me, you know, we may end up with a decent plan, let's say, <laughs> which takes a couple of visits. But, um, you know, what I like to say is my first time patients are, they're sweating, I'm sweating, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to think about, you know, why am I at the dermatologist for an hour plus? But after a couple of visits, you know what patients say, and I love it, is they come and they just lie down and they're basically going to sleep. And they said, if it's there, you're gonna find it anyway. So I'm just gonna relax. <laughs> I love that. Okay, uh, two more questions. One, a follow-up for the scalp question. Um, are you comfortable saying which creams? Um, like Aldera uh, yeah, or very commonly, yeah, Effudex or 5 fluorouracil is used on the scalp. It's a little bit aggressive, but sometimes you do need to be aggressive on the scalp. Got it. Okay, and last question. Can you tell us if the use of the device of devices like an iPhone or a computer, do you feel like that exposes us to any UVA or UVB rays that could be causing skin cancer? You know, I'm not 100% sure with that, to be honest. I know there's like blue light, um, and I know that blue light causes some issues with eyes. Uh, I don't think there's enough information, but I can certainly say that when I treat patients with PDT or photodynamic therapy, the light that is emitted from computers can actually keep activating the chemical that I put on the patient. So there is something there, but um, and maybe we'll find that in the future. Uh, but as far as I know, there isn't a direct correlation. So for instance, I don't see patients who are like, you know, doing computers all day and then they have cancer everywhere now. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Knock on wood. I was going to say, I'm on a computer all day too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We're getting a lot of great feedback. They're saying thank you very much. It was very informative. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Shim, for your time, for everyone that, that stayed on to the end. I, oh, I you. know. Um, we'll send out this recording and we really do encourage you to share it with family or friends. You know, as Dr. Shim said, skin cancer is a lot more common than we, a lot of us would like to think about and believe. And it's really important knowledge to know. And, you know, hopefully you could even potentially save someone's well, life. I just want to say one thing, okay. which is that it should never scare you because skin cancer is so, so treatable, so, so preventable. And, you know, someone like me and other dermatologists, our goal is to find it when it's very little, very little and of no consequence. And even if someone were to have a melanoma, you know, it's, it's something that we can take care of. I have patients who've had five melanomas, six melanomas that I found. And guess what? They're leading very happy, healthy, busy lives. So one should not be afraid to go to the dermatologist and think, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, they're gonna find the melanoma, that's it. Don't worry. As soon as it's, I like my, one of my patients loves this phrase, it's in the jar take it off and it's in the jar and not getting the nice lunch you're you know, thinking of getting for yourself. So I love dermatology for that reason. And please go to your dermatologist and just get checked out. Thank you. Really powerful words. Thank you so much. Um, so everyone Thanks have so a great much. rest of your evening and we hope to see you soon again at Laser Skin Surgery Center of New York. Thanks, Dr. Shim. Thanks everyone. Bye.